All right, hey guys, this is Mikey, aka Hiel here. Um, today we're gonna talk about a tough subject that you won't really hear in most of these modern churches nowadays. Um, and the tough subject is about woman inequality with men. Um, we're gonna break it down in a second, but before we do so, let, let, let us pray, please. Thank you, God, so much for your opportunity to be here together today in this this wonderful time. Regardless of whatever goes around us, Lord, we know that we don't deserve anything. And all the blessings that you give us each and every day, we're not worthy of, nor could we ever be. So we praise you always, Lord God, and I pray that you allow the Holy Spirit to move me, Lord, to speak your word truthfully and only to honor you and not men. Thank you so much for everything you do, and thank you again for this opportunity to pr praise your name. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Okay, guys, so for this topic, you're going to have some people, very few, that will accept it as God's word. You have some that may be more hesitant at first, and then later hopefully the seeds plant. But you will have many who will be repulsed by this, and I'll receive a lot of hate and a lot of negativity, if you will, um, for speaking this topic. Because as we know, most likely, or usually, in today's day, the popular opinion brings destruction. It's not... The thing for God. Um, so we're going to start off with just the basis of this. And the basis is the fact that men and women aren't created equal. Just just straight put, straightforward, you know. Um, we'll go into the different topics, you know, and maybe even some of the things that the, the other argument could provide, which there really isn't any. But the, the arguments that they generally try to somehow create some kind of loophole or some kind of small thing of scripture they misinterpret to go against the stack of scripture that clearly shows this, the truth, the biblical truth. Um, but yeah, we'll start here. First Genesis 127. Um, you hear a lot of these modern churches nowadays speaking and saying that women and men are both the image bearer of God. And that's clearly antithetical, which means the opposite of what we see in Scripture. Um, hence the reason you have these new translations that keep trying to water it down more and more. If we go to Genesis 127, as you see before you in the screen, uh, we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, the argument generally people will put here is that when he says he made a man in his own image, he's referring to mankind. Well, we see a huge problem in that because right after, same sentence, it says in the image of God, he created him. Him is in a non-gender specific term. It's a very gender specific term to men. Um, plus the man, his own image, he says man. And right after the same sentence, as you see at the end, it says male and female, he created them. So he even makes that clear distinction that he's talking about man as in men. Because he, then he separates them afterwards, man and woman. Right? And we'll see this repeated later on in New Testament. It says the same thing. And I'll read that to you guys in a little bit and just clarify once we get there. Um, so we'll go over here now, actually. Excuse me. So here we go. We got 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 16. Okay? And we read. Here we go. But I would you have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Again clear distinction that there's a totally different levels here totally different thing there's no equality on the same level it's showing woman we're the we're the head of woman and the woman the head of us is jesus christ and the head of him is god we'll keep going every man that prof praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonoreth his head but every woman that prayeth or pray prophesy with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head for it is even as all if she was shaven and we'll skip down a little bit so we can go past we've got two more um, lines down. excuse me <clears throat> For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. Wow, bombshell here, right? Same thing again, which is going off of the Genesis. Because the scriptures, they always coincide. They don't, they don't contradict each other. A lot of people have this misunderstanding that the Old Testament doesn't, that we don't, it's not relevant anymore, right? No, it still very much is. There's just certain things that don't apply anymore, like sacrificing animals for the blood, etc., because Jesus did that for us already. But it's like things like the Old Law, like as, uh, the Old Ten Commandments and certain other things, they all still apply, very much so. Um, so we keep going. So again, this is a bombshell because it says, he's, he's explaining why they should cover their head when they pray or prophesy. But it's saying that, again, the man is the image. The image, see that clear word? And the glory of God. And there's a clear, huge distinction of different levels here because it says right after, but, right? Which is, a, which is saying the opposite. Okay, well, this is this, but, but woman are the glory of man. They're not even the glory of God. Yet, not, not, not even the image, right? But they're not, they're not that glory as well of God. Men are. 
women are the glory of man. Because we'll go through as well and see the whole point of existence for the woman was for man. That was the whole purpose of creation. Um, so we'll keep continue going. And we're going to, mind you, I'll explain this again later. And I'm going to put this out there as well. I'm not saying, or nor is God saying, that women are worthless, as you'll see like in the Muslim cultures and stuff, where they treat the woman like straight garbage, etc. We'll see that God actually says the opposite. But we need to understand that they're not equal. And this whole new equal movement, the, hom the, the several different types of homosexual stuff like that, we, we're changing God's word significantly. Something that we haven't done for thousands of years has always been the same, but now this last hundred liberal years, we've changed God's words drastically to meet the new social climate of society. And we can't be one with the world, right? We're not supposed to be best friends with the world. We can't be. Scripture is very clear. It's just a separation there that we have to be set apart and that we're not going to be liked or appreciated because of it. We'll be outcast and we'll be hated, but Jesus was hated first, right? Okay, so... And then here we go. Um, going now to verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Again, clear distinction that the woman was her point of her creation was for the man. Um, for this cause, the woman has get power. Let's just see the woman, man without the woman, neither the woman without the man. Okay, so we skip. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so we go next to the Exodus again, which goes a little further, right? And this is another thing that shows it as well, because in the Old Testament, if you look at the New Ten, the Ten Commandments, right, which is still very much applicable today, which Jesus signifies, right? It talks again. We'll see, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maid, man, yeah, manservant, nor maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Do you see that? It's labeling his wife as his property. The wife belongs to the husband. Again, clear distinction that they're not equal. The whole point of a woman was made was for man. She's the man. Like as we'll see later as well, same thing like divorce. It gives a very clear distinction that the husband can divorce with sexual immorality. It doesn't say the woman can. Um, which again, that's led to a bunch of different issues as well. Divorce, as you know, the high rise, etc. Now, like I said, I'll get. I guess I get that disclaimer again in a second, probably in the next slide. But um, again, so we see that again here. It's talking about. She's the husband's. She belongs to him, right? And we'll go to more things as well that talk about complete submission and obedience to the husband and how that shows up to God. There's a clear, again, level of distinction here. And like I said, people are going to hate me for this, for speaking the truth of God. And really, I don't care because my, my goal here is to please God. You can't be a man pleaser and a God pleaser. You're either one or the other. Scriptures show that as well, which I'll go to at the end. But my whole job here is to explain the truth. Like This is probably one of the biggest, but yet never spoken about issues in the modern church today um this is huge like if you see in tongues i think 80 percent of people who speak in this more pentecostal tongues of gibberish which isn't biblical by any means is woman um you see this new leadership woman in church and so, well, i'll get to some of that in a second but it's just again we need to make sure we're staying strict to the guidelines and glorifying god okay we don't really go through anything in our society nowadays we're not really sacrificing anything you look at the people in the third world countries who are constantly dying, getting their tongues cut off, their limbs cut off, getting scarred and tortured for Christ. That's living for God, and that's awesome. That blows us out the water. But here in America, we have nothing we, we get persecuted for. We might get hurt on our jobs, or we might get slandered verbally, or maybe even hit here and there. But we're not living for Christ. We're not, our lives aren't on the line for Christ. We're not dying for Christ. What are we worried about? Wealth and social status? That, oh, I don't want people to say bad things about me? It's a joke. If you think about us living in America right now, Christianity in America is a joke. Um, so it's very clear that we need, to, we need to put this out here. This truth out here needs to be going. We're not here to please people. We're not here to make church a place where people are like, oh, I just want to get some feel-good moments, which you, you do want some of that. Don't get me wrong. But that's all the church is nowadays. There's no calling out what sin is and keeping each other sound in the faith as Titus talks about. And Titus, excuse me. Um, but you don't see any of that. It's not in the church nowadays. It's just this go to church, get your feel good, and you're good. And then go to church and be Christian for an hour and then go back to live your regular lives without showing God. Um, so we'll keep going, though, as I break down. The, I'll break down some of the stuff more extensively in the future videos. Um, but as we go here, Matthew 9, 3 through 9. Okay. <clears throat> so we see, okay. And uh, he says, And behold, certain the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing the thoughts, said, Wherefore do you think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven, or rise and walk. Um, I just gave you guys the wrong verse. Give me one second. Yeah, I gave you guys a... Wait. 
Did I? Give me one second here, guys. This was not foreseen. Okay, the verse I'm supposed to be giving you guys is totally off. Give me, I'm sorry about this. One second. One momento. Oh, I think that's supposed to be 19. Did I delete that? Oh, there we go. Yes. Okay. I did that wrong. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. So we're back. Okay. Excuse me. So here we go. Okay. So the Pharisees came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and so cleave to his wife, and they shall twain be one flesh. Um, 6 says, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Well, why did Moses give, then give command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffereth you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, which is put away, committeth adultery. Again, showing clear distinction that the wife is the one that, again, the property of the husband, but he's, they're supposed to be, to be one flesh together after they're married as one, and you can't put her away unless of fornication, right? And again, not saying the woman can do this to the husband, but only the husband can do this to the woman, right? And again, it even goes afterwards that if a woman does get divorced, she can't marry again, or she commits adultery again, right? And this isn't a guideline to a husband, it's just to the wife, Okay, but we'll continue to go forward. Again, just a little bit more of what we talked about. This one goes back. We'll go backtrack a little bit. And we're going to talk about the construction of man versus woman, right? So when we look at Adam, when Adam was created, what do we read here? And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils breath of life. And man became a living soul. Okay? So there's a construct of man, right? This is how man was made. Excuse me. Um, oh, excuse me. So he made Adam up from the dust. The whole body up from the dust. Here we go for what we spoke about a little bit earlier with the creation of Eve and woman, right? It says, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. See that huge word there? A helpmeet for him. Didn't make someone equal someone else. There's a helpmeet, a helper for him. And the whole purpose, again, for him. And out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called everything, living creature, the name that was thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast in the field. And for there was not, oh, excuse me, but for Adam there was not found a help me for him. Okay, so here we go again. This is when it gets to the part again. We're going to understand the difference construction here, as well as Adam was named man, right? So God named Adam and he formed him completely. We see that he needs, he sees Adam's loan. He's like, he needs a help me, which just also shows that there can't be such thing as a woman. It's not biblical for woman angels, right? Because woman didn't exist and angels clearly existed before man did, right? Um, as well as all the angels in scripture are men, right? So here we go again to verse 21. And he says, and the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh of thereof instead. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her to the man. Okay, so here we go again. So he's not making woman the same way as he made man. He's making woman from a piece of man, which it talks about throughout the scriptures. We think we read one or two already and we'll read some more. But it says the woman's of the man, right? She's a piece of the man. So he didn't construct her completely like he did a man. He took her and constructed her from a piece of the man. It's a significant difference there. Um, but then we go to 23 as well. And Adam said, this is now the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Again, significant here that she's not on the clear level of equality as we would say nowadays. Um, and then not even that, that Adam named woman, not God. God named men, men, but he had Adam named woman. 
So again, God didn't give woman their name. He had Adam do it. Again, because women are made for the glory of man, while we were made for the glory of God in the image. And again, he talks about she's the flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. Now we'll go to some kind. Sometimes we have uh, some people trying to they try to give the out there arguments. And generally in, in, in Christianity and in, in following God and his word, we're going to see usually a lopsided thing of, of evidence, the word, right? Supporting one side of doctrine, right? But we'll have maybe one or two little itty bitty things that someone will take out of context and purposely misinterpret to support their view, right? And they're like, oh, right here, this, this little piece, what about that, right? And that's usually what happens in most parts. And most people go with it because people cherry pick God's word. They try to cherry pick the word of God to live the life they want to live. Oh, I like this part. I like that part. Oh, I don't like that one. I'll find a verse to go against that, yada, yada, yada. And we can't do that. We're supposed to, if we're truly living for Christ, we need to die to ourselves daily, right? That's what Jesus tells us in Matthew. If we don't die to ourselves daily and bear our cross, we're not worthy of him. So we need to make sure that's what we're doing, not living for ourselves or our will. Same thing with this topic. A lot of people who are going to get mad and repulsed, you're not living for God, then you're clearly living for yourself because this is not what you want to hear because you're worried about yourself and what you think should be fair, or what you think you should be at, at a certain level rather than being completely humble and, and meek to God, which we'll go through that in a while as well, the qualities, excuse me, of a godly woman. Um, so here we go. We go down to, oh, actually skipped the wrong thing here. Give me a second. So we go to some people like, oh, well, what about Esther? Esther, she was a leader. She was godly and, and she was super godly, which I'm not saying she wasn't godly so much, right? But the story that we now hype up Esther to be is some super godly. She's used as a huge example of, of godliness and, and courage, right? Um, as well as a woman leader. But uh, as we clearly see the scriptures, she's not. She couldn't do anything without the base of the king's consent. The king was the leader. She would go to him for any guidance but we also see that this courage that we supposedly nowadays have changed and, and mistranslated again wasn't courage to begin with um if we read here in the text esther 4 10 through uh 14 we see that esther spoke to had attack excuse me <clears throat> hathak and gave him a command for mordecai and all the king's servants and people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called he has but one law put all to death except one the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter except her, excuse me, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to the king's, the, the king these three, 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, right? So that's what she's saying. Oh, hey, this is what the king's decree. I can't go. I'm going to die, you know, because this is basically give a long, short rundown that the Jews are going to die. She needs to go there. If she doesn't speak anything, she's going to basically let them die too. She thinks she's going to, she's basically cowers to protect her and her family's house, hoping that they're going to be the ones surviving because she's the queen, right? And then so we see here that Mordecai calls this out. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish, or as the King James Version says, will be destroyed. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time like this. So he's clearly saying, he calls her out, and then of course this is afterwards when she changes up her mind now and her answer to say, okay, I'll do it. Only after he told her that, hey, you and your dad's house, you're going you're gonna to die. You're going to perish. You guys are going to be destroyed. If you don't do this, don't think you won't be. And then after that, she obviously gets to say, okay, I'm going to die. I better do it. Because she was cowering in the first place. So it's, again, to understand the difference here. But I don't want to go too long because it's a pretty easy topic to, to, um, to dispute. So we go down to, excuse me, um, keep going to the wrong one. Oh, man. Oh, I didn't have another one for this one, did I? No, I didn't. Okay, so we'll go to... Um, Okay, so we talk about, just in general, we'll go to talk to discuss the subject about uh, Deborah, excuse me. Um, and they talk about Deborah. Oh, she was a judge, right? And she was a prophetess, right? And if we go in and we look at this, okay, so Deborah was a private judge. It talks about how she did her judging under a tree in the back, which was private. It wasn't something in the public she could do, right? Not even that. It talks about, through judges, it talks about how everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes, okay? And we go on first, and we see that... Um, there's also a difference between this, this text. A lot of Old Testament does give us things that are descriptive, right? And descriptive means it describes a story to us and gives us understanding, usually so we can either repeat it or don't repeat it. Um, and then we have prescriptive, which is prescribing us to follow that, basically, which means to do it, basically. So, like, the walk of Jesus, which is, most of the New Testament is prescription. We're supposed to follow everything we read versus just being a story. Um... And this is clearly a descriptive one, which is not to repeat. Um, so we see a constantly throughout the, um, the judges, it talks about how when she spoke to like um, 
Barak, and when she spoke to him, and it was in private as well, so it was a judging we talked about. But uh, Wayne Gruden, I don't know, I think I have the text from Wayne. Anyway, Wayne Gruden, the co-founder of the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, he says this. He says, Judges 4.4 suggests some amazement at the unusual nature of the situation in which a woman was actually to judge Israel, because it piles up a string of redundant words to emphasize that Deborah is a woman. Throughout the text, when you read it, you'll see that talks constantly keep saying that Deborah is a woman. Clearly, this isn't a good thing. It's saying it as a bad. Um... Here we go. Translating the Hebrew text literally, the verse says, And Deborah, a woman and prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. Something is abnormal. Something is wrong because there's no men to function as judge. Right? This is an impression when we read of Barak's timidity and rebuke he receives, as well as the loss of glory he received. He could have received, excuse me, because he didn't. Right? That's a, and you, you see that as well. When even Deborah, when she's constantly warning him, she keeps telling you, hey, hey, Barak, if you don't do what God told you to do, don't forget what he told you to do. And if you don't do this, you're going to lose your glory to a woman. And she constantly says this over and over and over again, making it clear that it's a shame. If you don't do this, you're going to lose this to a, all your glory to a woman. The one will be the war will be won over to a woman. And again, clearly a bad thing. Um, as we go over as well. We see that in uh, Isaiah 3. I didn't pull that up. I'm sorry about that, actually. Pull it up real quick for you guys. We see that again as Isaiah 3. When we see David. Ooh, I'm over here messing up. Uh, Isaiah 3, what, 12? Yeah, 3, 12. Okay. All right. We see in Isaiah 3, 12. Okay, here we go. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, which they lead thee to cause to which lead which they lead the with they which lead thee to cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy pass. Again, clearly a huge rebut rebuttal or rebuke of the way they're living. And it clearly says again, and woman ruled over them as a bad thing, and the children are their oppression. So it clearly says it's calling them out and telling the ways they're living are to err, like they're wrong. It's destroying the ways of their past. Again, Clear distinction that's wrong. Again, an easy subject to talk about. But we're going to go more into the easier, the more like New Testament, which is a direct application of how we're supposed to live our lives, right? Completely all of it. But yet, somehow, it gets avoided or ignored. Okay, so we'll go over to, we'll start at 1 Timothy 3. Um, this is a pretty good one to start, just the basics, because some people are like, hey, wait, women can't be leaders in a church? Which is absurd, when, which you'll see in a little bit, because they clearly can't even speak in church. Right? So how could they lead? But we'll just look at the basic rules first of what's the requirements for women to, I mean, not women, excuse me, for the leaders of the church. What's their requirements, right? So this, there you go. This is Paul. He says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, and a good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to eat. To teach, excuse me, <laughs> not given to wine, nor a striker, nor greedy, not not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For a man know not how to rule in his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being filled up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Okay, here we go with the deacons, right, lower than the, the pastors. Likewise, must the deacons be graved, not double-tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy of filthy, filthy lucre, holding a mystery of the faith and a pure conscience. And let these also be for proved. Then let them <coughs> use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be not slanderers, and sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of deacon will purchase themselves a good degree and great bold, uh, boldness <coughs> in the faith of in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Again, pretty clear. Excuse me. Um, that again, this is in the guidelines. It clearly says a husband of one wife. And then it gives the other guidelines that they need to follow, which honestly, most not likely nowadays, most pastors don't follow these. But, oh, don't qualify. But yeah, again, so the clear guidelines of what's required. And clearly, women stop that. But we'll go see even further now, which is going to, you know, that would be nothing compared to this. So we go to, again, so we go to the completely submissive, can't speak in church and the godly qualities it talks about for women what's, what's required right versus something again things we don't ever hear nowadays here we go first corinthians 14 34 through 35 let your woman keep silence in the churches silence for it is not permitted unto them to speak 
but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Now, this is very candid, very straightforward. Again, people could be offended by this, but this is God's word. Do you see what Jesus, they, they paint him now as some soft, politically correct person. Jesus was very bold. He's very loving, but very bold. You can be both, but nowadays we can't say anything without offending someone. And if you're offended, it means, again, you're not focused on God. Someone's saying the truth of the Bible, why would you be offended? Unless you're clearly living for yourself and your wickedness, not for God. Um, we need to speak the truth, which you see Paul talk about constantly, being speaking, always speaking boldly. And that can never be taken away from you if you're living for God. Of course, try to always speak gracefully and, and tell the truth lovingly and have loving as your intent. Loving is being your intent that I'm telling you this because I want you to progress and I want you to live godly. And I want to see you in heaven. Because if you think about nowadays, a little off topic, but all the people you see like at stores and Walmart, most of them are going to hell. And that's a pretty, pretty heavy thought that why are you not taking the opportunity you can to speak the gospel to them? Or being a light into them, not being the same thing as you see everywhere you go. Um, like I'll, I'll get into about the qualities of a woman. Like I have a wife and, and three little girls, so no way am I. Do I hate women? I just w want the woman to be godly, like they need to be, because clearly nowadays it's not the case at all. Like I said it's a huge problem in the church. Um, and if you see the qualities of women, which I'll, I'll show you in a little bit, and you're gonna say. Dang, I don't know if I've, I can count more on one, on one hand of women I know like that. Because it's like, yeah, it's pretty significantly rare in America. In third world countries, yes. Here, not really. You see all the women are the exact opposite. And actually it's to the point where the women who complain to be Christian are the same as the women who don't. And that's, that's a problem. We need to make sure we're living for Christ. And that the woman will take the role if they're truly Christian because it's, like, so I'll get into this in a little bit, and, like, and they're going to accept it because it's living for God, not themselves. But we'll get into that in a second because I'm going like, to use the context of scriptures, of God's word, because that's key. Make sure you're always using God's word. Don't just take other man's word. Don't even take my word, what I'm saying. Make sure you look the scriptures up yourself and study it yourself and make sure you're using the appropriate context. But yeah, here we go. We'll go into the next scripture right here, 1 Timothy 2, 7 through 15. This is Paul again. He says, Whereunto I am an ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. I teach of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath and doubting. In like manner also, see this key word here, he's talking about the men, right? Praying everywhere, lifting up the holy hands, right? Without wrath and doubting. Now it's saying in a similar manner. So it's telling you, it's, it's just, again, making a distinction. It's, it's clarifying that this is how the men show it. Now let me break down how the women show it, right? Okay, and it says, let the woman adorn themselves in modest apparel. Another key thing that we don't see today. If a woman's not dressing modest, she's clearly not modest, right? You can't be immodest. You can't be modest intrinsically, which means like internally. And you can't lack that excuse me uh, outside and be that inside it just doesn't make sense right it's impossible it's a paradox so that's key and the modest apparel will you'll see nowadays i remember my church back in the day um used to be known as a church that woman to church with a uh, woman with long skirts because it's so out there right um it's pretty crazy but that's just the facts you even go to church nowadays like what are the, what are they wearing but we'll continue. Um, with shame, okay, with shamefacedness and sobriety. This is a significant word here. Shamefacedness, which a synonym or similar words mean extremely bashful, which means you don't want attention. It means you want to be in the background. You're hiding. You're you're not trying to seek attention. You want to be back there. You don't care about anything else. You're not focusing on yourself. It's another quality of meekness, etc. And when do you really see that with women nowadays? Everything is about the woman. You see the weddings, etc. If you think about deep life right now, the normal living, everything is about the woman. The woman gets mad when things don't go away. They even have this saying, happy wife, happy life. That applies to like so many people nowadays. It's crazy because now the word has changed for woman for man to now men for woman. Just because they don't want to hear them nag and go, etc. But we'll continue. Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Another huge issue, especially when you see Christian women, quote unquote, because... I'm saying that because most women, people, not even just most women, most people, men and women, who claim to be Christian aren't. We, it's clear. As scriptures tell us it's going to be few, not many, and that you can tell them by their fruits. And as we know, most people don't live for Christ. But we see this with women a lot. The costly array, the pearls, the big earrings, the costly clothing, the hair done. Like, scripture is very, tell, it's telling you right now what a godly woman looks like, right? And that's the opposite of this because they're not decked out in all the things trying to look out there extravagant right costly array the pearls stuff on their hair the stuff on their, ne their big necklaces nice necklaces they're humble so they don't need any of that 
but we'll continue. But which which becometh woman professing godliness with good works? See, it tells right that that's them. That's how they profess their godliness with good works. It's explaining it right there. Don't really see that. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. This is key again. See how this is a common theme. It constantly talks about a godly woman will learn in silence, silent, complete silence, which means not talking. Women will be quiet. A godly woman will be soft spoken and quiet. Do you see that nowadays? This is the exact opposite. You see women, they're usually significant. They have big mouths. I'm sorry. Just I'm going to put it that way without using any more scientific terms. But they, they're loud. And they're really out there. And, and focus on self. And if things don't go their way, then they usually, yeah. You know it, right? Um, so then we go as well. And by suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Again, very clear here this is not me speaking this is god and his word it's very clear that they don't they can't teach or sub authority over the man you can't teach man or sub authority over him again very straight court there's no way to misinterpret this most of the scriptures in general are so easy and plain cut there's no need to try to however you can misinterpret most of these are just ignored oh that doesn't apply nowadays this is god's word new testament this is the whole point of this is a clear God for us to walk our lives, right? Of course it applies. Um, but we'll see again. For Adam was first formed, right? Then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived in transgression. Notwithstanding, should be saved in childbirth if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Again, clear, clear distinctions. We'll go over to Titus 2, 3 through 5. This is talking about the aged woman teaching the, uh, the young ones, excuse me. Here we go. And yeah, the aged woman likewise, that they behavior, they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, keyword again, chaste, keepers at home, good obedience to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That again, significant, and it tells you at the end, which is a critical, critical line at the end. It says that the word of God be not blasphemed, and it tells it is that if that's if that's happening, if that's not happening, excuse me, you're blaspheming God's word, and we see that this is definitely not the way. We hear the phrase, I know, like one of these professional gamers just got uh, kicked off the team for telling a woman that she should be in the kitchen, get back to the kitchen. Well, that's true. And, yeah, he might have been saying it in a more malicious way because he was frustrated or whatever the case may have been. But, or he was just being smart and snarky because, but it's the truth. It's the heart, that is a rule. If you look at the scriptures, it talks about when it tells her to be a keeper of the home. Proverbs 31, they talk about, right? It tells her to be a, a, a keeper of the home. And people will try to use the, the scripture of, like, she's supposed to provide some extra income, right? Which it does say, but it says her hand's on the spindle. Somehow we forget that, which is sewing, which... Just staying at home, you sew, you know, and then you give you merchandise, which, again, we change them all, again, to misinterpret God's word to do this. But it's clearly telling us, keepers at home. And this, honestly, I'll go off topic a little bit, which isn't really too much off topic, but it's a problem, again, with the woman working so much. When they're working so much, you have man, husband and wife now gone all day. They come home, she's tired too now, doesn't want to do anything, doesn't really get interaction with the kids. The family is the number one influence for kids, for the youth, right? The number two is friends. So if you're not giving that influence to your kids, then the number two influence becomes a significant number one. And this happens so all so much. And where you see like there's not really interaction with the mom, the lovingness that used to be, the family time is not really there. And then the divorce rate's significantly up. Not to mention both spouses are with other women and men way more than they're with their own husband or wife because they're at work all day and then they come home, watch TV for a little bit, go to sleep. Um, rather than taking care of the house and, and nurturing the kids and showing the kids how to be and showing them the love in Christ and then taking care of the husband and serving him as well, which, again, we don't see at all, unfortunately, and this would be considered sexist, but this is the truth of God, so I don't care what you call it. Um, just to be quite candid, it's just like I said, I'm here to please God, not man, but I want people to know the truth, and then from there you make your decision. Um, yeah, so we continue to go on as well to Ephesians. Oh, this is this is good right here, guys. Um let me make sure I got everything right here. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So we go to Ephesians, right? 525. This is a verse that everyone knows all too well, right? And it's always spoken at the churches. It's it's pretty cool, right? It's uh, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has also loved the church and gave himself for it. This is somehow, this is just the verse you always hear. And, and it's very true. The context that you use it in is wrong, but it's very true, right? Okay, so 
I'll apply that to you right now, actually. So we go to the, let's read the verses ahead because you have different contexts, right? You have the immediate context, the book context, the chapter context, right? And this clearly is the context before. You'll see it applies as well. It's not just a one verse thing and a different subject. But we see before it, which again is always avoided and you don't ever hear it. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. I mean, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You submitting yourselves to your husband is you submitting to yourself to the Lord. Because as we saw the verses before, the man is the head of the woman. The woman is the, I mean, and the, Jesus is the head of the man, and God is the head of Jesus. So if a woman honors God, I mean, a man, that's her honoring Jesus, which is their honoring God, right? If she dishonors the husband, there's no possible way she could honor Jesus or God. It's impossible because it goes in a hierarchy, right? So you honor the, say, the woman right here. We're the head, right? So she has to honor him. Then if she honors him, therefore she has a chance to honor Jesus, which there honors God. If she, you can't skip levels. So if she doesn't honor a man, she's nowhere close. Of course, she's not honoring God or Jesus because she's too focused on herself. And like I said, it's pretty simple. But yeah, as we see here, again, so yeah, okay. So for the husband is the head of the wife. Again, it goes into this again. Again, how important this is. It's repetitive, right? Because it's so obvious that it's so straightforward that we need to understand it's God's word. But for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, again, it's getting the same kind of comparison right here, right? I just gave the one that talked about in a few verses, I think, 1 Corinthians. And this one talks about it as well, but this one's giving with the church. She says the church is subject to Christ. It says, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Just like the other scripture, I think, complete, right? Complete submission. Submission means complete. It means a whole, 100%. It doesn't mean just some things here and there. No, it means complete. Right? And this one says it again, in everything. So it says to be a submission in everything to your husband. Just as a church is subject to Christ. Right? Again, showing the same thing. Can't be honoring God or Jesus if you're not honoring your husband as being sub um, submissive, excuse me, or subject to him. You can't be subjecting to Christ. You just can't. Because you doing that, disregarding that, is disregarding Jesus and God and their instruction. And then it goes to husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. So the whole thing here is it's a clear disclaimer for husbands. So I'm putting this out there, right? Telling you guys, well, I used to submit to your husband in every single thing possible, right? But it breaks it down to the husbands. Now, wait a second. Just because you have this power, don't abuse it. Don't treat your wife like garbage, like you said, like the Muslims, though they have no worth and they're just trash and you don't care about them at all. This is the love them even as Jesus has loved the church, right? Because they he uses the same logic as the church, right? The subject to Jesus. So love them, even though he loves them. So even though they're subject to him, he still loves the church and he gave his life for it, right? So it means to love her and treat her well. So not just because I have the power of my wife to tell her to jump around 20 times, do some backflips just because I say so. No, that's abuse. That's, that's not love, right? But she needs it. So it's, it's a relationship there. So I need to love her and honor her. But at the same time, she's complete and missing me to me in every aspect of life. So it's a disclaimer that to be a good leader and love her truly, which one of my new videos coming up, we'll talk about what true love is. Again, something that we don't ever see nowadays, true charity in that. Again, we'll go over that. But okay, so we go to First Peter as well. <clears throat> Three, one through seven. Again, same theme here. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if they, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word. One by the conversation of the wise. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair or wearing gold or putting on of apparel. Again, significant, the, the dressing, the going out there with the nice stuff in your hair, the earrings, the flashy the necklace, the nice clothes. Not doing that, because that's not modest, is it? Not at all. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in which that is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. Do you see that? A meek and quiet spirit. Spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. So meek and quiet again. This is a reoccurring theme, but it's a great price in the eyes of God. And again, we don't really see that with women nowadays, unfortunately. But okay, for this, at this man of the old time, the holy woman also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being subject in, in subjection, excuse me, to their own husbands again. And even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are. As long as you do well and not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Again, clearly not equal, right? They're the weaker vessel. And being the heirs the grace, together of the grace of life, excuse me, <clears throat> that your prayer not be hindered. But even in secular science, right? They clearly talk about what would like leadership. It talks about a leader can't be emotionally, right? They can't make decisions emotionally. It's subjective. They have to be objective. 
But then you see another scientific um, research showing that women are completely emotionally created. The, ra the way they, div they, made, they make decisions, everything about them is emotionally. It's subjective. The orientated, excuse me. <clears throat> and so clearly you put the two together, they can't be leaders, right? But secular science won't say that because that would be offensive and you hold this nonsense. But same thing with <clears throat> um, just in general. Like, we know they're weaker rest, so we know we say women and men are equal, which we clearly know. Like, they're, say, for the pay and stuff, right, for construction, for a woman to move 10 pounds of weight 10 feet versus a man who moves 100 pounds 100, but they deserve to be equal pay. Or the military, the police, or the firefighters who, the, the, if you look at the requirements for them, are, like, three times higher than the woman. The woman, the men have to do, like, 50-something push-ups. The women have to do the 10. They can do them on their knees versus, like, sit-ups, etc. Like, this clearly the guidelines are not equal. They're equal, then the requirements need to be equal, right? Or, like, the science that shows that, again, men's IQ is higher than women's, generally speaking. Yeah, you have some women smarter than men, obviously, but generally speaking, the men's IQ is higher. It's just different things in general, but, again, people don't want to hear, but it's the truth. So, this is the whole point of we're, we're people of God, we need to speak the truth and only the truth, right? Um, so, let me go over here and click this real quick. Okay, so now we're going to go to, what is this, First John? No, it's not First John. John, excuse me. Oh, no, I skipped over one more truth. Didn't I? Yeah, we did. Okay, so now we're going to go to like, the, more, the qualities of a godly woman still, but also with the things of, of a non-quality, non-godly woman, excuse me. So we look in Proverbs 21.9. It says, it's better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Pretty accurate. It's saying, so it's better to go in a corner of a housetop, like a tiny, small little corner, than to be in a huge house with a brawling woman, an argumentative, contentious woman who's fighting or above, who has a big mouth, essentially. It's better, and I definitely agree, as we know. And that's, that's why I guess you see a lot of issues with men, is that we lost backbone to stand up and to speak the truth, because we don't want to hear women nag because it's annoying, and it sounds irritating, etc. And why? Stand up for God's word when you have back. We mean men of truth, men of courage, men of standards, and men of honor, regardless of what we have to face. And something that small, who cares? Again, how can you not deal with that or losing your social status or losing your job or losing money speaking God's word, but you would lose your life for Christ? Highly unlikely. As we know in Scripture, it says, he who is faithful in the least is faithful in the much, and vice versa. If you can't be faithful in the small little things like this, you're definitely not going to be faithful in the significant ones when your life is on the line. Um... We'll go a little bit further, though, to Proverbs 21, 19. And it says, It's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. And again, we know this is true. Men, if you're being honest, we know this is true. And even women know this is true because they don't want to deal with each other when they're, they're angry or going off. It's, again, it's annoying to say the least. Um, but again, it says it's better to be in the wilderness than in a with a contentious woman, an angry woman. It's pretty significant. We'll go again with uh, Proverbs 25, 24. It's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. Again, same theme here. Same thing, right? Proverbs 27, 15. A continual dropping in a rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Now, I'm going to explain this to you in a second what the difference is. I'm going to go one more continual dropping. A foolish son is the calam calamity of his father. And the contentions of a wife are or a continual dripping. We see this continual dripping, right? And a contentious wife, right? And then we go with the uh, contentions of a wife or a continual dripping. We'll go to the definition of continual dripping, which, um, the, the translation. But it's described as an irritating and unceasing sound of a fall, the drop of the drop of water through the chinks of a roof. So again, a very irritating, un unceasing noise. So very, again, irritating, which is exactly what it seems, but actually usually worse. Different, you can use a bunch of different words for it, but it's very, it doesn't cease, and it's very irritating and annoying. And we'll actually go a little bit further to explain more of what it is. Um, okay, so, yeah, okay, here we go. Um, here we go. Okay, so a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is his rottenness to his bones. And that one breaks it down much more clearly, much more, it has much more of an effect of the imprint in your mind or your heart that, wow, it's a rottenness into his bones. And that's pretty deep. Um, but we do see some light here for the first one. A virtuous woman is a crown unto her husband. Again, we're not putting women down. We're not saying women are worthless trash. We're just saying they need to be godly. And honestly, godly woman is a significant rarity. And we'll get to that in a second as well. But when it is a godly woman, you found yourself bigger than a jewel, way bigger. A virtuous, she's a crown to her husband. 
It talks about, I think, Proverbs 31 as well. You praise it because it's sees awesome. We're going to go to Proverbs 31, which, which actually makes a little bit better, more clarity. It says, who can find a virtuous woman? Clearly a, a question of how hard it is. Who can find one? It's basically saying it's almost impossible. And we can look in society and be like, yeah, it's definitely true. Because if we were honest, look at these women who claim to be Proverbs 31 women, or in general, they're usually big mouths. They're usually all up in the camera, usually on the front, which you wouldn't do. Because if you're really a truly godly woman, you're in the back. You're hiding. You don't want to be seen. You don't want attention. You're quiet. You're meek. As we've seen all these descriptions before, right? And clearly none of that. Again, if you really break down all the traits we've seen, how many women can you really say 100% that woman is a legit Proverbs 31 woman. She's a legit virtuous woman by scripture definition. You would hear the crickets in the background. Um, hence the reason it says this. Her price is far above rubies. Expensive. Imagine how expensive rubies are today, right? Let's think about thousands of years ago um, when the scripture was written. And let's think about how expensive they were there. And why are they expensive? Just like diamonds, but they're more expensive. Because of the rareness, right? The rarity of them. So, if this is far above rubies. Imagine how rare it is. It's basically saying it's impossible. Almost. So, the odds of you finding a really godly woman are very, very low. As well as the other scripture I should have mentioned as well. That talk about, it's better for a man not to marry. But if he can't, uh, if he can't, um, but he can't get, if he has the brain with lust, then to marry. Um, but it's just, it's, it's, yeah, the odds of finding that, uh, just to be quite frank, are very rare. And that's why it tells you if you do, her price is far above rubies. Like, you did beyond hit a, a gold mine. You, you're, yeah, and that's awesome. And that, I praise. A legit godly woman by biblical standards is amazing. But to find that, just to be frank, and I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people personally who have had this issue, finding is, is not, it's hard. And they don't listen. I've tried to give them advice, and then later on the road, they they made their life way harder by doing so. And we got to realize that, and they acknowledge now that it's so impossible because you don't find any woman like this, honestly. It's really, really rare. The third world countries, you'll have a better opportunity. But here, you don't really, just in general in America in the first place, it's just all about personal gain, etc., which is completely the opposite of God and you know, what Jesus teaches. But... Yeah, so we go to Ecclesiastes, which actually talks about this a little bit further as well. It says, I applied my own heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness and madness. I find more bitter than death the woman. Again, pretty clear, pretty out there. He finds more bitter than death. It's more bitter than death is the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape her. So whoever pleases God will be able to escape the woman. But the sinner should be taken by her. And we see that all the likely to nowadays. It's it's bad. Um, Behold, I have found this, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh. But I find not. One man among a thousand, one man among a thousand of them, he found one, one righteous man about a thousand. But a woman among all of those, he found, he is not found. So he found one minute of a thousand, but of all the women he, he found none that were righteous. Lo, I have only found this, that God hath made a man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. And again, pretty clear here, and it was taught, yeah, the only way to escape the woman in the clutches, especially nowadays, and is by pleasing God. You can't make man pleaser and God pleaser. And it's, yeah, it's just pretty clear cut. Um... Yeah, so we're going to the next slide here. But again, so we got to please God and focus on God, not on anything else. And nowadays it sucks too because like you see so many people are desperate over women. And again, things have changed, quite opposite. And it doesn't make sense because there's so many of them. And a lot of, most of them know what they were so desperate over, had really nothing to offer. Um, and they just put the husband through that much problems with there for later on in the road it becomes a bigger issue. So it's it's just better just to make sure you try to find it. And if she's a Proverbs 31 woman, that's awesome. But you still need to have the backbone and be a man, a manly man. Nowadays as well, we see this thing with the issue of masculinity. And supposedly it's toxic, but yet the women want it and they try to be masculine. But yet they want the men to be more feminine. Again, clearly of the devil. Again, the opposite of God's word. Men need to be masculine. But with that masculine, masculinity, excuse me, it needs to be the love and kindness. You need to be a man. And need to lead adequately and righteously by God's standards. 
and lead the woman the right way. So that way she can also lead the daughters and lead the younger women as well to follow this. And we've, we've lost this, and that's why we're such an, a, a bad place right now. We really want God to restore things and to slow down on certain epidemics, and we need to make sure we're living completely God for God and His will, not, not for our own. But yeah, we'll go over again, excuse me, to just different texts about, uh, excuse me, he's going over one more. Different texts about uh, turning from God's word, and, and Scripture talks about this, and it was talking about this is going to be happening, and we see it so much now. Uh, it talks about things will get worse than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And it definitely, I think it has, personally. Um, but we read Romans 9, 20 through 21. It says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing that formed him, that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not, the, hath not the powder, excuse me, power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel into honor and another to dishonor? Again, pretty key, clear here because I know like at friends we talked about this and they agree and everyone, because you, you can't disagree if you're, you're a Christian, if you're truly Christian, you can't. It's, it's so clear. There's no argument against it. But they're like, oh, well, it's not fair to be a woman then. Who are we to judge the potter? Who are the clay? We deserve nothing. Everything we've been given is unto grace, and we can never repay even a percent, not even point zero one percent back of it. We deserve hell. We've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, right? We deserve nothing, but Jesus came back with his mercy and grace and took our punishment significantly. He was beaten, battered, and bruised, and then died and persecuted and tortured on the cross for us so that we had the chance to accept him. How could we possibly be that selfish to think we deserve anything else? We didn't deserve that. So it's sort of crazy that we say this fairness. And even with men who are different positions of power, when they're, they're coveting or they're envy, it's like, how, how could you, man? Like, God puts a huge thing about humility and meekness. And that's significant because we deserve nothing. And if you don't have that mentality, then you're foolish. It's, I'm just going to put it straight forward. Because we deserve we, we, nothing we've gotten do we deserve. Just the breath we have right now. We didn't deserve. We don't deserve. It's grace. It's God's glory that we're here right now. Anything we're going through, any trials, tribulations we're going through right now, we're still significantly blessed to be going through it because we didn't deserve the life this morning to wake up to go through it. So we have to understand that and make sure that who are we to judge God? If a guy's a pastor and, and oh, hey, this guy's a, this leader over here, how can I say it's not fair that he gets to be that and I don't? I'm just grateful that I'm alive and grateful that God's blessed me to be as he thinks worthy of sacrificing and being tortured for his sake. Like it's a worthy, it's an honor to serve Christ. And if you don't have that mentality, you need to question yourself. Are you really a Christian? Are you really a follower of Christ? Um, we'll go forward though to uh, 2 Timothy 4.3. And it goes for, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves, teachers having itchy ears. And this is so true. This is saying exactly what we've done. For thousands of years, what I'm talking about, what I'm teaching, was always the standard. It's always the biblical truth. Lately in this last hundred years, maybe 150, you see it getting distorted more and more and more. Going back and forth, liberal theology took over a little bit, but then it, it stopped. And then now again, it's blown up the last 20 years. And it's clearly against sound doctrine. And it says they're going to be after their own lust and finding teachers having itchy ears because they want to hear what they want to hear. And you have heard multiple pastors, and they talk about this. It's, legit to, it's really, really hard to find a legit pastor or a church. But they've spoken and said, basically, if the Jesus came back today, most Christians would hate him. Quote, unquote, Christians, because they're not real authentic, obviously. Because the Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus we're trying to make him today. We've changed the Jesus to be what we want him to be. Basically, we're worshiping ourselves. We've modified Jesus to what, what, everything we like. Again, the cherry pie, right? The cherry picking, excuse me. Or the buffet. I want this, this. I don't like that. I'll keep that over there. And we made Jesus ourselves. We look in the mirror. We're really worshiping ourselves, not Jesus Christ. And everything that Jesus is, if we are really submitting ourselves, we're dying again for him, not for ourselves. And he tells us as well in scripture, he talks about, why do you say you love me, but do not what I say? And that's pretty key. You can't say you love Jesus, but everything about you is not doing. You're not doing it. You're still in the fruits of different wickedness. Excuse me. We see Romans 16, 17 through 18. Excuse me, chapter 16, verses 17 through 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they, 
for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And this is also true. Most of these pastors, especially the ones you see on TV, are jokes. I'm just going to be straightforward. They're false teachers. They're, wolf, they're, they're <coughs> the wolves in sheep clothing. Excuse me. And they feed on people's selfishness and greed. You see, like, Joel Olstein, You see so many of them. Creflo Dollar. That, again, are just blaspheme jokes. Like, they constantly feed on people's greediness. Like, the prosperity gospel. It feeds on people's greediness to give. So that way they can make more. And hence, these pastors are living well. They're not worried. They're only worried about their pockets and personal gain and wealth. Which they have plenty, believe me. Hence, the reason pastors making money is not biblical by any means and i'll get into that later um in different different sessions completely antithetical to scripture but we clearly see that with this they're teaching the most churches in general all of them are folks studies have sh clearly show it their whole focus is on money and attendance the church has legitimately become a business even at liberty university where i'm going for my doctorate right now that's all they're talking about is making adopting the business models that business have made that made them successful in putting that in the church and that's a joke because the church isn't a business and that's why it's failing so bad today we're not speaking god's truth anymore we're speaking, we're speaking what people want to hear to make people feel good and then go home and pay more money and, and truly it's a joke and we see it's what hap what's happening right now it's exactly what scripture tells us and they're using the fair speeches of adequate words right and just to deceive the hearts of the simple so you make sure that we're listening to god's word and his word only so we'll go to now <clears throat> living for god not man um, pretty deep subject here as well. Last last category, but uh, again, so we're gonna go with this this constant thing. We can't be men pleasers and God pleasers. It's not possible. And scripture will show you this in a second. My whole focus, like I've told you multiple times, is to please God, not to please man. I focus only on Him and His glory, not on what people think. Um, hopefully. People can be happy with what I say, but I know it's not because Jesus tells us that we're going to be hated, right? He tells us he was hated first, right? So it's okay. Um, and again, you can't be part of the world and of God. You can't love both, right? You got to be set apart as well as the light that doesn't, can't have fellowship with the darkness, right? Um, so we need to make sure, again, our only focus is on pleasing God. What people say about it, it's fine. It doesn't bother me. I don't care. Throw your stones. It's fine. I'm going to preach God's word no matter what. I would gladly be persecuted for him. Um, so it's John 12, 43. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And this is talking about the Pharisees, people we knew who were very wicked, right? Who were trying to act like they were living godly, but we knew they were really full of wickedness. That's hence the reason they hated Jesus so much and they had him persecuted. Um, <clears throat> Romans 12, 1 through 2. I, be I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Again, excuse me, um, pretty critical here because it's telling us we can't be conformed with the world. Perfect example, what I just talked about earlier, the couple thousand years where this was the right way to live, right? Nowadays, I'm constantly called radical. Anyone who has a similar ideology, a philosophy of God's word, accurately and truthfully, sound doctrine, will be considered radical. Well, thank you. That's a compliment because nowadays we don't live anything close to what Christians are supposed to live like. But back in the day, right, before this this liberal theology took over and this new modern church with some crazy ideas of relative truth, etc., um, before all that took over, the way people were living today was considered radical and in a horrible way because, of course, it is. Um, and we got to make sure, again, that we're transforming the renew of your mind. Again, renew your minds that you deserve nothing. Stop being prideful and selfish thinking that you deserve anything because you don't. Um, and if you're truly focused on God's will, like I said, this won't offend you because when we're truly focused on God's will, I don't care if it goes left or right. I'm submitting myself to, I'm subjecting myself to God. And whatever your will, my Lord, I'm going to go. I don't care which way it goes. Versus our will, we're like, I want it to go this way. It needs to go this way. I'm going to get mad. Like, again, we're entitled. We are, we're privileged. Um, and we deserve nothing again. And like I said, so we got to make sure we understand the difference here. Col Colossians, excuse me, <clears throat> 3, 22 through 23 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, that whatever is so you, what you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Again, this is a constant theme. Everything we do needs to be honoring to God, not to men. Can't do both. Um, we'll get to break down some significant verses at the end, but John five forty one through 44 says, I received not honor from men, 
but I know you that have not the love of God in you. <clears throat> I come in my Father's name, and you see me not. For if another cometh his own name, you receive him, or you will receive. How can you believe which honor one another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Again, bars. This is significant, man, because it tells us the difference of they're receiving honor from men, and he says he knows you don't have the love of God in you. If you receive the honor of men, you can't have the love in you, you have, which is like the respect of you're, you're trying to please men, respect men. Honor men respect a lot sometimes in some translations or some context, excuse me. Um, but again, how can you not honor one another and you don't seek their honor that comes from God? So again, you're seeking honor from them, but you're not seeking the honor from God, the only honor you could really receive, right? Okay, so then we go to Acts 5.29, which means, I mean, which states, Then Peter and the other apostles answered, We ought to obey God rather than men. Again, constant theme. Here we go, Proverbs 29.25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man. But whosoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Again, we should make it to the point we have fear of no one. Fear of nothing but God. That's just the beginning of wisdom. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we are allowed to, of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Again, this is, if we're truly living Christian life, we're going to follow the early leaders of the church that we see in the gospel. And none of them were pleasing men. No one, you can't. It's not biblical. Nothing about it makes sense. And we'll go to the last first few verses to show this. For there is no respect of persons with God. And that is significant. Very short verse, but very significant if you think about what it means. Okay, so let's just go over it one more time. For there is no respect of persons. So people pleasers, people respecters, right? The respect of persons is basically a people pleaser with God. And God's where? In heaven, right? And we even have a verse that goes along with that. And, and ye masters, do the same things unto them. Forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in, is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. There's no people pleasers, respect of persons in heaven. None. None with God. It's not, it doesn't happen. You can't. Right? How can you be a people pleaser and a God pleaser? Because people, in the popular opinion, is going to be against God. That's why Jesus was hated and outcast. That's why the apostles were hated and outcast. That's why Christians around the world right now are hated and outcast. Right? If you look around the world, third world countries, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, they all get along together. It's crazy, but they always work together to torture and kill the the Christians around the world. It's still going on today, which most people don't even realize, and it goes on significantly. Um, but again, we're not supposed to be the popular ones. We're not supposed to fit in with everyone, like like you see the, the Christian society doing nowadays. It's a joke. Hence the reason they don't talk truth about this, something like this, such as about the homosexuals, which again, we're not supposed to hate homosexuals. But we have to hate their sin and know that they're not going to heaven. You can't be a homosexual and go to heaven, which I'll break that down in another video as well. But we're not to hate them, just their sin. Um, but I'll go to the next verse right here. Um, Galatians 1.10. For, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For it, yet if I do, excuse me, for if yet I please men, I should not be the servant of God, of Christ. And servant, which sometimes they mean bond servant, which means slave. How can I be a slave of God, of Christ, if I'm pleasing men, I can't. If I please men, I can't be a slave of God. I can't be a servant of God. It's very clear. It's saying it verbatim. You can't. It's not possible. You can't be politically correct. Not even that in the first place, which I'll get into another video as well, but judging and love. But if I love you, I'm going to call you out. I'm going to keep you true to the gospel. And I'm going to do it because I love you and I want you to progress. Right? If I don't care about you, then I wouldn't tell you anything, and you can continue to, to stay stagnant or be lukewarm and then go to hell. Right? As we see in Scripture, you can't be lukewarm and go to heaven. You have to be all out for God. Um, and we see that in Matthew 7, it talks about, towards the end of Matthew 7, talks about people prophesied and um, cast out devils and, and devils in Jesus' name. He says, apart from me, I knew you not. Right? For they were workers of iniquity. So we see that you can you can do some things for God, wear some shirts, talk some Christian music, Talk Christian, but you need to be all out for God. If you're not all out for God, you're not going, man. You're you're twenty percent, fifty percent, sixty percent. It's not good enough. Eighty percent, you better be a hundred. Ninety nine doesn't count. That's just as bad as a zero or one. So you need to make sure you're all out for God. Um, and again, we can't be pleased to God. We can't be completely correct. Same thing with like sports. I'll give you an analogy with sports. If you're playing soccer and your footwork sucks, I can. I, don't you want me to correct you? So that way you can fix that footwork problem and then progress to be better at soccer and be as good as you can possibly be? Or would you want me not to say anything so I don't offend you, quote-unquote, 
and then you still suck and you don't progress ever and you're not good. So it's, it's just common sense. It's just how we can't keep being politically sugar-coated, coding the truth, excuse me. We need to speak the truth of God and please only him, folks, only on him, no one else. But also do that thing we do with love and grace, not just to puff ourselves up. But um, we'll also go to Second Timothy here as well. And this is one thing we need to understand as well that you're going to hear a lot. Like right now, I know I'm going to probably be in the stands for a while, maybe. Maybe I'm, I know I'm going to be in the stands a lot of times, which I have been certain. But Second Timothy uh, 4.16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me, which means abandoned me. I pray God that it might be, and it may not be laid on their charge. Um, and that's going to happen a lot. You're standing in God's truth, especially now that it's getting worse. You're going to be standing alone sometimes. But again, you're not alone because you're with God. Right? You got Jesus Christ. So you just make sure you're standing for him and not for people. Don't fear man who can hurt your body. Fear God who can hurt your body and your soul. So and put it in hell. So we need to make sure we understand that. And that live our lives for Christ. Don't worry about anyone else. I had a friend who talked about he one time that passed I guess a new woman took over the church and he uh he knew it was wrong and he was like he was too embarrassed to get up and, and walk out or say anything. And right there, I'm like, right there, you just denied Jesus Christ as Peter did. Yeah, you didn't say it verbally, but by not saying anything, it's the same thing as saying it. Your action actually does more than just your words, right? If your words are empty, I mean, if your words say something, and yeah, they're empty and your actions don't follow, it means nothing. Your words meant nothing. So he just rejected Christ for embarrassment. And we can't do that. Don't let us be embarrassed or ashamed or awkward to speak God's truth who cares what people will say or think we need to spare a word about only what the only one who matters what he cares or thinks because he's a true living God and we don't deserve anything he's given us so again all lies on him and focus only on him and his love and uh that's key again and like I said I'll say it one more time um it's not it's not a thing again again hate against women or anything like that except I have a wife and three little girls um and I love them to death and I'm making sure I raise them to biblical standards of how they're supposed to be raised. And to let them understand their, the humbleness and the meekness that they need to have. And the shamefacedness, the extremely bashfulness they need to have. To be in the background. to be And be content with that. Because they know that they don't deserve anything they have in the first place. And that's the whole purpose of God's creating them. And accepting that. That's the true love of God. If you see that in New Testament as well. What the women constantly do. They were serving the men. And they were totally fine with it. Right? You saw Mary washing Jesus' feet with her hair. They didn't care. They were they were meek and truly humble. They were never talk. You didn't hear anything big about them having big mouths. They didn't do anything. They didn't teach a lead in any aspect. No one did in New Testament, correct? So we keep talking about this thing. We're trying to find one, two little leeways. Not to mention, they're like, oh, again, the things I gave, examples I gave you earlier, which I, they're easily, easily um, rebuttaled. But not even that. You saw one point when uh, with Balaam, ba Balaam, excuse me, or Balaam, that, the, uh, that God used a donkey. So sometimes he uses he had to use these in the Old Testament. You see multiple times he used different ideas or interventions. And do we now follow donkeys or, or, or uh, allow them to have some kind of prophesying kind of ways or something? I mean, it's pretty clear we don't, right? So not to lead just in general. It's just we, we got to be clear what we're doing. And it's the New Testament, which is a direct application to our lives now completely. We're supposed to follow it to the T. And somehow it's been avoided and ignored across the board. And that's a pro problem. Um, and we need to make sure we're living for him again all focus is on him i hope you guys enjoyed this um like i said next one should be about love and ju judging i believe and it might not be we'll see um but either way i had a, a blessed time i hope you guys enjoyed this and you guys learned from it and that we can continue to progress in christ together um and like i said hit me up um send me any messages if you guys have any questions or any comments i hope you guys like said i hope you guys are doing well everything is going well in these weird times um, it's much love. I love you guys. I just want you guys to know the truth of God and to live for Christ in every aspect of your life. Every. You can't just sugarcoat and cut it halfway. Um, but yeah, so let's pray real quick, please, before we go. And let's go. Thank you. Thank you, Lord God, so much for this opportunity to be together, to fellowship with your name, Lord. We praise your name always, and we love you so much. And we pray that we glorify you in every single aspect of our lives, Lord. Let us glorify you and do the right things, Lord, and speak the right words and show people the right love and light of you so they, they want and they, they urge for your, your hunger and your love, excuse me. And let us always do the right thing to glorify you. Let's focus on you. Let us dwell in your love, Lord God. Let us not worry about ourselves or trying to please others or do things that are popular so we can fit in or be liked 
or be the, the cool one. Let us focus on sacrificing and obeying your word, Lord, living and, and dying for you. And we know that the faith without works is dead as well as vice versa. So we need to make sure we have the faith and the works, Lord, to follow it. As you say in Matthew 12, 7, 20, about by our fruits, you'll know them. You know them. We need to make sure our fruits are good for you, Lord God. Please give us the, the balance we need in the basis of being righteous for you, Lord God, is there that we sacrifice and die to ourselves daily to live for you and your glory, my Lord. Thank you so much for everything you do. Please bless everyone that's listening to this, Lord God. Give them wisdom and guidance. Open their hearts, Lord, and their minds so they can renew it in yours, Lord. And I praise your name always. Thank you so much for everything you do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you guys for your time. Um, like I said, any questions, please let me know. You guys have a great day. Take care and God bless. Goodbye.